Throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Paul Young is the author of New York Times number one bestseller, The Shack. With over 10 million copies in print, this book is an allegory stirring up conversations about the Lord around the world. The Shack points people to the love of God for us all. Paul says, everything is about Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit and relationships. Life is an adventure lived one day at a time. To learn more about Paul, go to wmpauljoung.com. Every act of God is done in collaboration with himself and he invites us to come into that relationship as well. Join author of The Shack, Paul Young, to discover how you too can live in a collaborative life with the people God has placed around you. Here is Paul Young. I have a friend named Ron Graves. Ron is, um, well, here's how it happened. I was, up until last February, I was, one of my jobs, I was working three jobs, and one of them was, at a manufacturer's rep warehouse for electronics. And that, I ran the place, which meant I was there most of the time by myself. <laughs> you know, because it wasn't this huge place. And, uh, and I was in charge of shipping, receiving, inventory control and management and janitorial, right? So I'm cleaning the toilets and stuff. The book had started to take off. And um, I, in the fall, uh, the book actually came out May of 07. And it was all in Brad's garage, and we had a website. So, but it started to take off by that fall, and I got an email. I'm working at uh, Mark Technologies, and uh, I get an email, and, and it says, your book has ruined my life in the best possible way. I live in Park Rose, which is near where I was working. If you ever have time for coffee, here's my phone number, right? So I just picked up the phone. The email comes in, I read it, I pick up the phone and call him. And I said, so where do you want to go for coffee? And he says, uh, 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 well, um, I live in Park Rose. I said, yeah, I know. I, I'm working in Clackamas, but I live in Gresham. He goes, oh, okay, um, right. Uh, so we talk logistics for about two minutes, and then he finally says, you know, I get invited to coffee a lot, and uh, usually by the end of the conversation, I can figure out who I'm talking to. <laughs> who are you? And I said, well, what do you mean, who am I? You're the one that emailed me and asked me to go out to coffee. This is quiet. Are you kidding me? This is exactly, what, it's exactly my Ron impersonation. Are you kidding me? Well, see, what I didn't know, I, I didn't know a lot, but what I didn't know about Ron, and when the book started to come out, there was this sense in my heart that, um, you know, Papa, I really need some intercessors in my life. I mean, serious, big-time people who will just pray. I just, because things were starting to pop, and, and things were, I had four kids down at the same time out of my six. All four who were home were laid out for the weirdest kinds of things. That had never happened to us before. So we're going, mm, this is not good. So I've been praying and asking the Lord. Well, it turns out that Ron is not just an intercessor. He has, like, uh, got a whole network of them, Right? Now, Ron is a man's man kind of guy. He, for 23 years, he played rugby, semi-professionally, right? And, uh, and I played some rugby. I was a hooker. Yep. <laughs> What's so funny? The hooker. You know, it's the smallest guy on the team. They usually go through three or four hookers in a season. And uh, it's a position in rugby, all right? And... <clears throat> So I'm talking, to, I'm talking to Ronnie, and uh, we met that afternoon. So we, we had this, like, we, we, we get together at St. Arbucks. That's where we kind of meet. And, and um, so... Uh, 
What? That's what it says, St. Arbucks. Okay? So we get together at St. Arbucks, and we have this, like, couple hour, just this unbelievable time. Find out he's a, you know, he's a rugby player, but he's an intercessor, and I'm telling him what's going on, and he's fired up about the book. He comes from a Catholic background, you know, and uh, Irish, and uh, I mean, it's like, ah, uh, this is so great. Well, we walk down to City Park, and we walk down there, and at the city park, I'm there. I'm going to meet his family who are coming back from a mission trip to uh, Mexico. So I'm sitting at a picnic table at city park, and a couple of his big guy friends, big guys, they walk over, sit down, and the guy across from me says, so how do you know Ronnie? And Ron's sitting next to me, you know. I said, well, we met on the Internet. So after that, I became Ronnie's Canadian hooker he met on the internet. <laughs> now, thank you. Oh my gosh! It's got to be chai. It's not St. Arbucks, but hey, it's close now. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, some, one addiction's left in my life, I think, you know. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> so. I'll tell you another story just to help you understand how I am in the midst of this huge whirlwind that I don't understand. Um, Ron, Ronnie and I were at St. Arbucks one morning, and, and it was like 6 in the morning. We had this conversation, at the end of which we were talking about how the Lord gives us names and where names fit into all this. And as he's getting in his truck, he says, Hey, Paul, you know who the Lord told me I am? I said, No. Ronnie says, the Lord told me I'm his champion. And as soon as it comes out of his mouth, it resonates, bears witness in my heart. Oh, that is so right. You know how, you know, that when that happens, you know, it's like, oh, of course, of course. And it's just perfect. It's a perfect fit for Ronnie. So, you know, me and my sense of weird humor, I just off the cuff, I said, well, you know who I am? And he says, who? And I said, I'm, I'm the court jester. And now, I don't think about court jesters much, right? In fact, never. But it just came out. And he, got in, he laughs, gets in his truck, and starts to drive away. I take two steps toward home, and the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not. So I have to call him. You know, Ron, you know what I just told you that I was the court jester? I'm not. <laughs> but I now know who I am. And he says, well, who's that? And I said, uh, I'm the enigma, the joke, and the riddle that's in the mouth of the court jester. And as soon as I said it, I knew I was right. And so did he. And I tell Kim, I walk in the house, and I, said, I tell her this story, and I said, I'm the enigma, the riddle, the joke that's in the mouth of the court jester. And she goes, oh, that is so perfect. Now, like I told you, I don't think about court jesters and stuff like that. I mean, it's just not a part of my world. And so this is on Sunday morning. That following Saturday, I'm still working at the technology place. And, and I get it, Mike, my boss, says, Paul, he says, um, we got an invitation by General Tool, one of our distributors, to go golfing. And, uh, and it's up at Resort at the Mountains. Resort at the Mountains, see, and I golf. I like, I like to golf like three or four times a year whether I need it or not, Right. I, I just like it. It's just getting out there. I never take it seriously, but I love being with somebody who does. <laughs> you know? It's great for a laugh. And, <clears throat> and uh, so it's at Resort of the Mountains. I hadn't been there for like 15 years, right? It's a beautiful golf course. He says, here's what we get. We get golf, uh, 18 holes. We get golf carts. We get uh, a big barbecue, and they give door prizes to everybody. And they're really great, tools and stuff. It's really not down my alley, but hey, you know, I can give them to somebody else. So, so I said, oh, that's great. He says, you want to go? I said, yeah, are you kidding? Well, this is the following Saturday after my little St. Arbucks conversation with Ronnie, right? So he says, but I want to go up early and have breakfast up there. I said, great. So I dropped my car off sun, uh, Saturday morning. We drove up there. I walk into the dining room at Resort at the Mountains, and I just start to laugh because the whole room is full of court jesters with those little things, you know? <laughs> I didn't know these guys even existed. 
right? The Royal Order of Jesters decided to have their national conference meeting at <laughs> Resort at the Mountains that Saturday morning, one, one week after I'd had this conversation, right? So I'm looking at these guys, and I can't believe it. So I walk over to one of them and say, I need a souvenir because nobody is going to believe this, especially my wife and Ron. They're not going to believe this. So he gives, I have in my bag over there the uh, uh, director's pin for the Royal Order of Jesters, right? And, uh, so, and, and I'm talking to these guys, and one of them says, you know, you know what a court jester does? And I said, sure. Well, no, not really. <laughs> and he says, the court jester was the highest advisor to the king. And in a room full of agendas, it was his job to communicate to the king and to whoever the audience was what the truth was in any way he wanted to. Ridicule, jokes, whatever. He was the one to destroy the agendas that were underlying the conversations in the royal court. And I went, that's interesting, because suddenly I realized, you know, I've got some literature background, and I'm thinking... Throughout history, in literature, Jesus Christ has been considered the court jester, Harlequin. He was the one that comes into this world full of agendas and communicates both to the king and to the audience what the truth is. And I'm going... And I'm, I'm the riddle. I'm, I'm the joke. I'm the enigma that's in the mouth of the court jester. What an honor. Oh, my gosh. So I go back and I meet Ronnie again. And he walks in. He says, I brought you something. I said, really? He says, I brought you the mascot pin for my 23 years of semi-professional rugby. He gives it to me, and I've got it in the bag, too. It's a, he says, look, it's a, it's a little blind pig in a court jester's outfit. And if you look real close, he's smoking a joint. <laughs> For a week, it was like the kids would walk by in court jester hats. I mean, it was just like, okay, I get it, you know? This is way too funny. And I really believe God has a sense of humor, you know? I mean, where do we think it came from? Like, okay, they fall, so let's give them a sense of humor. You know? I mean, come on. It was there the whole time. It's part of the character and nature of God. Where do we think jokes came from? And I think God is full of humor. I, got, I saw this cartoon where uh, God's up in the clouds, and he says, there, finally, we're finished creating. Oops, there's a few parts left over. And it says on the bottom, how the platypus came to be. <laughs> you know, I think that's great. I'll tell you my favorite joke. This is my all-time favorite joke. Uh, so guy gets to heaven, right? You all heard this, how it starts, right? Well, this guy gets to heaven, and uh, he's, he's an older man, and P Peter meets him outside the pearly gates. And he's looking at the pearly gates. He goes, um, uh, do I just walk in? And Peter says, well, you know, it, it depends. Well, it depends. Uh, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on if you have enough points. I didn't know we, had, we needed points to get in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many points do you need? Uh, you need 100, 100 points. Oh, Okay, well, uh, points. Um, well, I, oh, I served at the um, soup kitchen for like 15 years. You know, every Saturday, well, not every Saturday, but most Saturdays, I served at the soup kitchen. I did all these great things uh, down there to help the poor. Peter says, yeah, I'll give you a point for that. <laughs> a point. Yeah, 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 that's worth a point. Uh, well, I was a pastor for 35 years. I mean, um, I married and buried and preached, you know, and I was there except when, when I was on vacation and stuff, but that was in the contract. And, uh, um, I, and Peter goes, well, I don't know. Uh, oh, come on. Okay, I'll give you a point for that too. Well, now he's really disturbed, you know. That's kind of his whole life, and he's got two points. <laughs> and he's trying to rack his brain as to what he should come up with when he sees another guy from the same town. And he knows this guy. I mean, the guy's not that great a guy. I mean, he shows up at Easter and Christmas at church. And I mean, he, I mean he's a nice enough guy. And, but he walks right past them and into the pearly gates. And he looks at Peter and he goes, are, are you kidding me? Are you telling me that that guy has 100 points? Peter says, oh, no, he just doesn't play this game.
Now you see why that's my favorite joke, right? Okay, it's a great joke. <laughs> there, uh, if you weren't here in the last session, I kind of dumped my life, so sorry. But, um, so I'm, I'm kind of on the upswing of that. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but I want to talk to you about uh, this God that we are in this relationship with, this collaboration, and I want to talk to you about the difference between um, this covenant that we're a part of and uh, what was, used to be, and kind of the way that I grew up and how screwed up that was. And so I want to start this way. Every human being, every soul, is this unbelievably, delicately crafted, unique creation. Every one. There is no one who will ever be you, ever. Unbelievable. But see, we have no respect for that because we live in a world of commodities and numbers. And we have very little respect for it. That's partly why we have a struggle with the idea of theodicy, that there is a good God and a, and a world that's all screwed up and how those two things can coexist. Partly they can coexist because God respects his human creation way more than we do. This uniqueness gets uniquely damaged. If I can impress upon you a couple things, one of them would be, do not compare your pain with anybody else's. Do not minimize your pain, especially by comparing it with somebody else's. You can always find somebody who's gone through a greater trauma than you. But you know what? Your pain is real, and it's yours. You can put 10 children in front of the same abuse and you'll get 10 lives going 10 different directions trying to deal with it. You cannot compare your pain. How you are damaged is absolutely unique. And so is the process of healing for you. You cannot compare a healing track either. Even Jesus healed people physically but never did it twice the same. And physical healing is the simplest. It's not nearly as intricate as what it takes to heal the soul of a human being. Here is the verse. So I've had three sessions. It's time to use scripture, right? <laughs> I'm not a professional. Okay, come on. First Peter says this. You have a faith that is being tested by fire. We're going to talk about this in a bit. You have a faith that is being tested by fire, and this faith is worth more than gold... Chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, approximately. Worth more than gold that perishes. Gold perishes. You have a faith that is being tested by fire. Now, let me put an aside here and say, I have some bad news for you. Most of the time, that fire, you know, it's God. He's a consuming fire, and uh, that fire is usually him. <laughs> you know, which is kind of bad news, but it's really good news. Because he loves you, and the reason that he's a consuming fire is he's going to burn everything away out of your life that is a piece of crap, that it doesn't help you, it's not part of your healing, it's not part of your freedom. He is coming after everything in you that is wrong. And he does it because he loves you. Not because he's mean, vindictive, and you didn't live up to his expectations. God, has, God is never disillusioned with you because he had no illusions about you to begin with. He, he loves you to the depth of how much he knows you. So you have this faith that is being tested by fire, this faith that is worth more than gold. And now it says, and now you are receiving the object, the goal of this faith. Now this will surprise some of you. The object of my, I'm receiving. Okay, so that's present tense active. That means it's an ongoing process. Okay, there's a process here. We are now receiving the object of our faith, which is the salvation, which is the same word for healing, the healing of our souls. Souls. The object of this faith is the healing of our souls. And I said in the last session, the soul is the shack on the inside that we build that gets help, help people help us build that is just all the corruption and the damage, right? 
And it is our own self-centeredness along with what other people have done to us. And it's the house of shame and the house of pain where we hide our secrets and our addictions and everything else. And when we spend our energy trying to build something on the outside that is pleasing and acceptable to the people out there. And the house on the inside, who is us? It's our soul. Never gets healed. And then religion comes along and says, we've got a way to heal this. Um, okay, if you pick this path, there's like five pillars. If you pick this path, there's like seven steps of enlightenment. If you pick this path, there's like 652 uh, rules so that you don't break the Ten Commandments. But if you take, you know, if you pick the path of evangelical Protestantism, there's only like four million rules. And, uh, and if you can keep those, then you're, you're good, see? So we can fix the damage by performance, right? Sorry, never going to work, never has worked, never will work, won't work. That's religion. So this soul, what's the soul? That's the basis of how you think, the mind, it is uh, the imagination, the, the emotional life, all of those things. You are now receiving, it's an ongoing process, the object of your faith, which is the healing of your soul. See, we, we put our souls on the back burner. As soon as we got saved, we thought, okay, it's, um, it's about being like Jesus, right? And so we then become performers now, re religious performers, as well as all the other performances that we're trying to do to please our dads and trying to live up to the world's expectations and, and trying to compete with each other. And we're, we got to sing better because we got to find somebody who, you know, but we run into people who do it better than us. And that's a problem, see, because we're in competition. It's all about flesh, and the soul and the body make up the flesh. Now, surprise, surprise, the flesh is not a bad thing. Are we in agreement? Because, you know, Jesus Christ came in the... Okay, okay. So we know it's not inherently a bad thing. It's been labeled a bad thing. And some people have even made the mistake of saying the flesh is the old nature. Especially if you read the new irrational version. Um, the new international version. Okay. You know, I probably have a bone to pick with every kind of translation there is. So don't, you know. But I really dislike the fact that they translated flesh as old nature in the NIV. Just ticks me off. Because it's wrong and it teaches a theology that is fundamentally wrong. Because then you begin to identify this body and soul as the old nature. And now we're trying to regenerate the old nature rather than have a new nature that dwells inside the flesh. And the conflict is between flesh and spirit. Not between new nature and old nature. I don't know if any of you grew up with the black dog, white dog theology. Which is inherently racist, but you know. But, but I grew up with it. You know, you have a black dog, which is the old nature. And you have a white dog, which is the new nature. And... Who are you going to feed today, right? That was the theology. So, and how do you feed the black dog? By doing all the fun stuff, right? How do you feed the white dog? By prayer and fasting and reading the Bible and giving. And It's all behavior, and it's all up to you. You know what they didn't tell you? They didn't tell you, is the feeder part of the black dog or part of the white dog? They didn't tell you that. Because who are you going to feed? Who is the you that is feeding? Well, the ultimate conclusion is that it's part of the black dog, because sometimes it's feeding the black dog, you know? Which means that in your mind, how you think about yourself is that you are fundamentally the black dog, trying to beat up yourself so that you can arise to some level of spirituality and righteousness that God will accept and approve. Oh yeah, and maybe the Holy Spirit can help you. But he's no good at it either, you know? Because I'm still doing all the same kind of crap, the addictions are still there, everything's going... I need some healing here. And if the flesh is fundamentally your old nature, how can you be receiving as the object of your faith the healing of your soul, which is part of the flesh? Do you understand the conundrum here? So we got something else going on. What if, what if we are spiritually alive and that's our fundamental new nature identity housed in a mortality that is still being saved, but God's intention is to save it? To heal it. That changes everything. Because suddenly we are in a process of healing. Spirit, soul, and body. And that also means that we get rid of New Age Gnostic theology out of our Christian education. You know what? I get, I get accused of being New Age, right? 
because I got a Holy Spirit who's named, or the Hindi name, and because, what are the other reasons? Oh, God is a woman, you know? You know, look at I have a ringing in my ears. <laughs> As an aside, let me tell you a story about that. Remember where I was, so I don't forget. I was about ready to tell you about Gnostic, New Age thinking inside the church theology. Okay, okay. So Kim, she, her family is really different than mine. See, her family is big, large, you know, North Dakota, Minnesota, salt of the earth. You know, I was telling folks earlier that they're genetically enhanced to all talk loudly at the same time and understand each other. And, um, you know, you betcha, right? How you doing then there? Right, cool, you know? So my family, small, religious, we hide everything, lie about almost everything, and we have, we have to have an order of service to get together, right? So, <laughs> so I am, um, we used to live in a town called Boring, Oregon. We lived there 17 years. We lived in Boring, Oregon, home of the Boring Baptist Church, you know. Hey, there are, there are some Baptists that tell the truth, okay? <laughs> you know, they did. Uh, well, we did have a boring burger. We had a place called the Boring Burger, and it did go out of business. I wonder why, you know? And um, so, uh, but we lived in Boring. We, oh, we just moved. We now live in a rental house in Happy Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I told you God has this sense of humor, right? And they're right next to each other, like there's no in-between. You're either bored or you're happy. Come on, you know? <laughs> so we were at a wedding at the, actually, that was St. Something Episcopal. They, I think they, I don't know why they didn't say boring Episcopal, but anyway, it's at the St. Something Episcopal, St. Paul, I think, and uh, in boring. And it was a traditional wedding, old-fashioned wedding. And uh, they had this one time in the middle of it where they, and I don't hear this very often in weddings anymore, um, uh, if there's anyone here who knows any reason why these two shouldn't, whatever they say, have sex legally or whatever they say, you know, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace, right? Remember that? And there used to be this awkward silence and everybody's hoping nobody says anything. <laughs> they don't ask that anymore because there's too many reasons, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we only have an hour, right? Okay. Line up at the microphones, right? So, um, so... Here we are during this silence, and we have, we have tried to duplicate this. Never been able to happen before. I can't figure out how it happened. Don't know. But my phone not only went off, it went right to speaker. It didn't even ring, right? In this silence, one of Kim's not quiet sisters, Lynette, says in a very loud voice, Hey, Paul, are you still in that silly wedding or what? She had the audacity to use my name, so I couldn't even go, Nicholas, turn your phone off. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, right? So I don't care if phones go off. It gives me an opportunity to tell the story. I only had to use my own phone once. <laughs> so the, um, anyway, back to Gnostic thinking in the church. We have this mentality that says, Somehow I can wrestle myself to the point of submission where what people will see will be just Jesus. Right? I must decrease so he can increase. It's the same thing when somebody says, well, that was a beautiful song. Well, you know, that was all the Lord. Right? This is New Age thinking. I don't know if you realize this. It is where we are moving toward where the spirit becomes everything and the physical reality of who we are diminishes into nothing. It's kind of like God's goal is to get at least a few billion Jesuses. I got news for you. He's got one. It's all he wants, right? He only needs one Jesus, right? His goal, his desire is to wed everything that he is in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to everything you are, spirit, soul, and body, so that you become this unbelievably whole manifestation of the nature and character of God, the likes of which will never be seen in the history of the human race or the universe. You matter, and you matter spirit, soul, and body. There is no part of you that doesn't matter, and his desire is that you become everything you were intended to be, not disappear into some spiritual language or mystical 
everything spirit. The all spirit is Buddhist, right? Where we lose the, the, uh, the folly of this uh, physical mortality and it disappears so we can merge with the all spirit and we become one with the all spirit and we lose our individuality. I'm sorry, Jesus says, I will leave the 99 to go find the one. The one matters and you are the one. But see, we, we put God on the same level as maybe our parents, you know, or our fathers. A lot of times, I'm sorry, and I, I on, on behalf of the fathers of my generation, I ask for your forgiveness for the crappy way that we have raised you and we have shown our affection to you and the fact that we have swallowed the same junk and the lies of the world and conveyed that to you. We have really screwed up with the best intentions, but we did it. I have a friend, and I may have told this story already, but he, uh, he was about 12 years old, and he wanted to try to do something to please his dad. Because he had a dad, you know, it was one of these, well, your, your defense was good, but your offense sucked, you know. I mean, you got, a, you got all A's, you know, but one A minus. What's with that, you know? And nothing can please. And we want the affection of the Father. We want the blessing of the Father. And so he decided he's going, to, he's going to wash his dad's car. So he does. He takes like four hours, washes his dad's car. He uses the toothbrush, everything. His dad doesn't know he's washing the car. He does it, and then he waits until his dad comes out for some reason. He just waits. And his dad goes, oh, and he walks over, and he walks around it, and he goes, oh. Oh, look, you missed a spot right here. And his dad went into the garage, filled up the buckets with water and soap, and came out and rewashed the whole car. My friend says, that is the last car I ever washed. And we put God in that same category. You know, I painted the face of God with the face of my father. Disapproving, disconnected uninvolved, angry, violent, you know? And then we wonder why we have a, a, a struggle with the character of God. That's because we think we've had this conversation with him, right? Paul, you and I have a problem. This is God the Father talking. You and I have a problem. You keep screwing up, you know? But I have a solution for us so that we can be okay. I'm going to take my son, who I love the best, out to the woodshed, and I'm going to beat him to death. And then you and I will be okay. Oh, trust me. That's a problem. Trust is not something you can do. Trust is not an activity. Trust is the fruit of a relationship in which you know you are loved. If you don't know you're loved, you will not trust. That's why fear and love are opposites. Perfect love casts out fear. The one who fears is not perfected in love. Fear and love are opposites. When fear shows up in my life anymore, you know what my first prayer is? Okay, what is it about the way you love me? I don't get right now. Am I thinking you're not involved or am I thinking you're not good? Am I thinking you don't care about me today? What is it? Why this fear? Because perfect love casts out fear. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. That's an observation, not a value statement. But see, we even read the Bible from our shame base. And whenever we run into a verse like that, we're going, see, I'm such a loser. He says, that's an observation. I'm not telling you you suck. I'm saying, if you've got fear, it's because you don't know you're loved. That's an observation, not a value statement. And so we've got a God who's in the distant heaven who's got us on a... You know, we're trying to pass the test, right? And it's pass-fail. And every time you fail, you've got to start over again. We're going to get this right sooner or later. And life becomes just this struggle to please God. You know there are two paths. There are lots of paths, but I'm not to God. I'm not saying I'm a universalist, okay? <laughs> In terms of spirituality, you can, t you can take the path of trying to please God which I took and thought sounded holy and spiritual and right, or you can take the path 
of learning to trust him. They are mutually exclusive. You can't take both paths, take one or the other. The, the path of trying to please God, you will only end up in behavior. Everything will be about you. What are you doing for God? After all he's done for you, the least you could do is shape up, right? Like a friend of mine says, I figured it out. The two best times in my life were before I became a believer and after I die. Everything in the middle sucks, you know? And he's saying everything is about behavior, trying to please God and failing. You know, some people are better at this behavior stuff than others of us. I was telling folks earlier that I wasn't very good, I never have been good at quiet times, and I'm really not knocking them. I think for some people it's just a wonderful thing. It's a way they connect with God and stuff. For me it was just tedious and boring and would make me fall asleep. And, and I struggled with that because in Bible school, you, you know, it's a sign of spirituality. So I had a friend of mine, his name's John Wheeler, and he's kind of a damaged boy like me. And uh, so we were talking one day because we're always trying to figure out how to do this spirituality stuff. So he says, you know, I got this roommate, and every night he prays. And he prays a long time. So I've decided, this is John talking, I've decided I'm going to, next time, tonight, when he gets down on his knees, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray as long as he does. I said, good, good for you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to try that. But, uh, <laughs> but hey, more power to you. Let me know how it goes, you know. Well, he comes back and he tells me, he says, Paul, when, he, when my roommate got down on his knees, I got down on my knees. And I started praying for everything I could think of. He said, I prayed for all my relatives. I was, he's, he's an American, and he, we were up in Canadian Bible College. And he says, I'm, I'm, praying for, I'm, I'm praying for Canadian provinces. I don't even know where they are. And, and, uh, and he says, I prayed through every missionary, every you know, political leader I could think of, and I look over, and he's still praying. I'm going, what? So he said, I went through it again. Now I'm praying for people in soap operas and, you know... <laughs> You know, I'm, I, I'm literally, I'm praying for cats and dogs by name. And, and I went through my, he says, Paul, I went through my whole list three times. And I look over and he's still praying. And I was so mad, I went over and went, what are you praying about? And he, huh? <laughs> He'd been asleep for like an hour and a half. We are in a process in which the soul is going to be healed. And that is God's intention. And, surprise, surprise, he doesn't use shame, condemnation, or guilt to accomplish it. That is a big surprise. We want extreme soul makeover, right? We want, send me to Disney World for a week so when I come back, I'm all fixed, right? Slay me in the spirit, do something so that when I come up, I'm different than I went down. Right? Can't we do this quick? Do you have a blue pill or a red pill? <laughs> because of your uniqueness and the intricacy of who you are and the way you've been damaged, it takes time, care, and God working in the midst of our circumstances to accomplish your healing so that he doesn't abuse you the way you have been. We are this ball of yarn that's been tied up into a million bazillion knots. And it's a total mess. And we bring it to God and say, this is all I got. And he's the only one who has the wisdom to untie the knots in the right sequence and never break the string. You cannot compare your pain with anyone else's and you cannot compare your healing with anyone else's. The big chunk of my renovation, Mackenzie's weekend, wish it had been a weekend, for me was 11 years. From January 4th, 94 to the end of 2004. And 2005, I was finally ready to write a little story for my kids. This process of healing is what the object of faith is. God has come to make you whole. Lee. Holy. And it is a marvelous process, but because we have overlaid 
shame and guilt and condemnation, and we put that in the face of God. We get stuck. It's kind of like if I had two bars of silver and I had uh, a a bar of sterling silver here and a bar of processed silver, right? If I had both those bars, what are we doing time-wise? 15, okay. So if I have these two bars of silver, one's sterling, one's processed, you looked at them both and I'd say, which looks better? You tell me the sterling silver. Because processed silver is kind of ugly, you know? But sterling silver, it's shiny, it's bright. You can see yourself in it, right? You know why it's shiny and bright and you can see yourself in it? Because it's got more impurities in it. It's got a lot more junk in it. And those, that junk reflects an image of yourself back to you that you think's real. Sterling silver. See, we're all, we're all this little bar of sterling silver. Now, we get into this relationship with God, and he's actually been working on us way long time, Right? He called the disciples, disciples and friends before they were even alive. You know? So there is a process involved here. And and so we're in this relationship with God, and we get into some service where we're singing, and and the Holy Spirit's going, hey, let's let's pray this song. Okay, set me free. You know, dumb, let me tell you. I mean, think about what you're asking, right? Now, I got to tell you, If you don't ask for it, somebody else will. That's what prayer is all about, right? Somebody who loves you enough or hates you enough to pray for you, right? And and they will will pray and ask God to just interfere with everything in your life. Now, he doesn't even need them. He'll find a Pentecostal to do it in a language they don't understand. (laughs) It's a stacked deck. I mean, he's, he's stacking it and... And he's doing it because why? Because he loves you is why. Why does he heal you? Because he can use you like everybody else has? No. He's not interested in using you at all. He heals us because he loves us. And then he invites us to play. We have a God who joins with us. Bart said, God will not be God apart from us. So we have this bar of silver, right? And, and we're praying, or somebody else is praying, or we're singing it, or whatever. And God comes in and starts to uh, light, or turn the heat up in our lives. Now, God is a great, uh, he is of such a character that there is nothing that you can bring to him that catches him off guard. Or that Satan can, or that anybody can. Right? Satan, you know, I'll tell you why he's so mad, Satan. Because he hasn't come up with one idea that God hasn't been able to use. I mean, that wouldn't that tick you off? I mean, the thing he thought was his greatest, finally, turned out to be his demise. That would tick me off. If that, you know. So he comes, and every time, every time he comes, comes to God and talks about Job, God says, okay, I can use that. You know, that's perfect. Perfect. You know? Oh, come on. So God begins to turn the heat up in our lives. And what happens? Well, the bar of silver starts to melt, you know? And uh, things start to get a little warm, a little hot. And when the silver melts, what happens? Roils around in this, and up comes to the surface what? All the crap, right? In this process, all the crap will come to the surface. You know, and at that point, the religious people are going, hey, crap, you know? And, <laughs> and you're going, what? You've known me how long? You think I'm perfect or what, right? Right? You don't think there's any sin left in my life or what? You know, because all the stuff's coming to the surface, right? Now, partly, other people don't want to be around you right then because they think the heat that is generated so that your crap comes to the surface is going to melt their bar of silver. That's what that's going on, right? Because they got a bar of silver. They're going, hey, I don't want want to be near you. You're starting to melt me and my crap's coming to the surface too. I don't know if you (laughs) noticed... But when you're around somebody whose life's falling apart, all of a sudden you want to control them, you want to change them, you want to fix them, you want to, uh, all your stuff comes out too. See, that's what the heat generates, right? And so we got all this dynamic going on around, and we think God is the same. We think God's going, okay, let's heal them. Okay, so um, let's turn up the heat, turn up the heat. Okay, it's rolling around. Oh, ah, crap.
I'm so disappointed in you. You're the one that turned the heat up. Why didn't you just leave me as a bar of silver? I looked a lot better, you know. And we put God in that. Listen. Listen to how beautiful this is. When the crap comes to the surface, you are closer to healing than you ever were when all your stuff was locked into a bar of silver. But because we evaluate it like the world, we think when that happens, all hell's breaking loose. Well, it is. It's just that it's under the care and the attendance of a God who needs it to come to the surface. And that's when we need each other in our lives to skim the crap off the surface. We need to be close enough to each other. Confess your hurts and faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's just when the religious performance stuff wants to drive us away from each other. Because we don't want to be associated with you. Because your crap's getting on my nice white suit. And it's where we need each other. And you know how God looks at this? He says this. Get this. From glory to glory, I'm changing you. From glory to glory. Not from cruddy to glory. Right? And not even from glory to glorier. It's all the glory of God. Transformation from glory to glory. I have begun a good work in you, and I will perfect it. The beauty of this is this is attended, and we don't have to look with our physical eyes to see what is happening. When stuff starts to happen in my friends' lives, and the crap comes to the surface, I can grieve with the process, because some of it is so painful. But I can rejoice, because look! It's at the surface. It's not hidden. It's not behind closed doors. It's not behind some kind of performance. It's actually there. And that person is closer to healing than they ever were when it was all hidden away and locked up inside a nice shiny bar of silver that they could say, can't you see my face in this? We are in a process of transformation. And God knew that judgment, condemnation, guilt would never produce one iota of righteousness. So he nailed them to the cross. You know what saved my life? When I reached for the door of my shack, God wasn't in some distant, disapproving heaven. But Papa came flying out the door. He had been inside my mess the whole time. I use this image, and we'll close with this. I use this image in the book where Papa, God the Father, has nail scars on his wrists. And it's upset a few folks. How can you do that? Well, it's in the Bible, sort of, kind of. What happens when Jesus is on the cross? See, we have a theology that says, Father says, you know, Jesus, I know you got to do this, but I can't look on sin, you know, and I'm holy and stuff, so I'll be back in three days and pick you up. Right? And so God the Father goes off somewhere, and then Jesus does his thing, and then he comes back and raises him from the dead. People think there was a separation between Father and Son on the cross, which is a fundamental theological issue. Fun, it's, it's, creates a very, it's called neo-Arianism. Because as soon as you take God away from Jesus, you only have a man left. And you lose the deity of Christ. You can't do that. So what did happen? And people have built this theology on, on the cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he is quoting but from the heart and his experience, David's psalm, right? Where David cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And David's psalm, there's resolution in that psalm. I don't know if you realize that, but there is. So what's going on here? Here is Jesus Christ, who is a human being, 100%. God, 100%. Human being, 100%. He never draws upon his deity to accomplish anything. He is fully dependent on the Father for everything. He says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. 
I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. Oh, let me give you a little aside on that. It makes him look strange sometimes because of this. You know, it makes him look like a liar sometimes. Uh, there's two situations I can tell you quickly about. One is at um, the wedding at Cana. You remember that? Where his mom says, hey, Jesus, um, we have these uh, friends who are going to be embarrassed if, uh, you know, because they're running out of wine and stuff. Um, can you do something? Now, he hasn't done anything. He's like 30 years old, not done nothing, right? Just been hanging around the house and stuff. And um, you'd, you'd think, you know, it's God, and he's in a world that's all fallen. You'd think he'd done something by now, right? Hasn't done nothing, right? And even though he'd done nothing, his father, when he got baptized, which is before this, his father said, hey, this is my boy. I am so proud of him. Okay, very cool. So, but his mom says, do something. He says, and he doesn't even, he's not nice about it. He goes, woman? It's not like mom. He goes, woman? My hour hasn't come. What do I have to do with this? What? You're always saying that. Your hours never come, never come, never come, you know? Because <laughs> what does Mary do? She goes, eh, hey, hey, you guys, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And Jesus does it. And you're going, well, that was weird. Well, here's another situation. His brothers come to him and say, hey, Jesus, we're going to go down to the festival. Biggest festival of the year, most fun. Come on. He goes, no, I'm not going. Oh, come on, come on, come on. We'll have a great time. Fun festival. He says, I'm not going. My, my hour has not yet come. I'm not going. Oh, and, and the gospel makes a big deal out of it. So, and they, he says, guys, go, just go. Have a great time. Go, I'm not going. So they go. And as soon as they go, he goes. <laughs> what, he just lied to them or what? I thought he couldn't do that, right? Well, here's what's going on. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. Jesus, we got these friends to do something. Woman, my, my hour hasn't come. What's the Father saying? Ah, your hour hasn't come. Hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Father, now. Oh, okay. Right? Same with the brothers. Come on. Nope. Father's saying, my hour hasn't come. Nope, my hour hasn't come. So they leave. Father says, okay, now your hour's come. And he goes. The instant communication of a relationship that is intensely intimate. He lives from that. And now you've got this Jesus who was born of the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, hanging on the cross. He becomes sin for us. And in that, he enters into the depths of our experience. And part of that is, where are you? I don't feel you. For the first time in his experience, he doesn't sense the presence of the Father. And in that, joins us. Because all of us have experienced the absence of, the sense of the absence of the Father. Every one of us. And Jesus becomes one with us. And he's saying, I don't know where you are. I'm surrounded by all this crap. Where are you? And in that moment of joining us, he then makes the greatest statement of faith that he ever made as a human being. He says, but into your hands I commit my spirit. I don't feel you, but I know you're here. And Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 5.19 agrees with Jesus. And he says, I'll tell you where Father was. I'll tell you where Papa was right then. And Paul writes this. For God, the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. 2 Corinthians 5.19. Where did reconciliation happen? It happened on the cross. And where was God the Father? In some distant heaven where he couldn't look upon sin? No! He was in his Son reconciling the world to himself. When I reached for the door of my crap, God comes flying out from the middle of it because you know what? 
He knows everything there is to know about me. And Jesus knows everything there is to know about me, and they both come to reside in my heart, which is my soul. In the middle of all this mess, and they are intent on healing me from the inside out, something the law could never do from the outside in. And Jesus, who identifies himself with me, says, I'm not ashamed to be called your brother. But look at all my crap. I'm not ashamed to be called your brother. And Papa says, honey, I will never leave you or forsake you. I never did it with my son. Why would I do it with you? In Greek culture and Roman culture, you could disown a biological son. But if you adopted one, you could never disown that son. Ephesians. From before the foundation of the world, he predestined us to be adopted as sons. We finally are beginning to understand we have a God that loves us, who pursues us with relentless affection and is intent upon our healing regardless on how long it takes. We're not in a race against anyone else. We don't have to compare our hurts to anyone else's or the process of our healing, and it's never too late. In fact, we're right on schedule because God is God. To the praise of his glory. So, Papa, I thank you. I thank you for our lives. And we come and we bring our messed up shacks and we come and we bring our little balls of yarn that are all just knotted up and got all this debris in it and it's a mess and we got nowhere else to go. We got nobody else that can heal us. Come do your thing. Heal us from the inside out. And we bring, we bring our love the best we know how. Some of us, it's not much. But we know you don't have any expectations so that you can accept whatever we bring as a gift. It's all we got. And all we ever have is always enough. Thank you. grace is sufficient. Your mercy unending. Holy Spirit, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you. We love you. Heal us. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time. May you become fully alive in the love of God.